No. Okay, this isn't turning on. And with me, it's really not necessary. Okay. So I understand about this. But trust me, I grew up in a family where if you didn't speak up, you didn't get heard. <laughs> We're turned on and good to go. We are ready. Yes. Okay. Okay. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And welcome to this time of prayer and praise. Um, a few announcements this morning. Please take a look at the prayer requests. I'll be dealing with those when it uh, comes time for the um, pastoral prayer. Um, from the um, just coming up this coming week is the 80th annual Jamestown Community Fair. On October 19th is the emergency fundraiser uh, auction. Please note who are going to be the lady readers and the greeters. Um, any other announcements uh, this morning? Uh, continued unspoken prayer requests. Continued unspoken prayer requests, okay. Yes, of course. And our joys, we have our German family here today. Christina and Louis. Okay, great. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Okay, anything else? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Our call to worship is responsibly uh, myself as a leader and you are people. I come to you, Lord, for protection. Do not let me be ashamed. Do take me to promise and rescue me. Listen to my prayer and hurry to save me. Be my mighty rock and the fortress where I am safe. You, Lord God, are my mighty rock and my fortress. Lead me and guide me so that you may be honored. Protect me from hidden traps. Keep me safe. You are faithful, and I trust you because I trust you. First hymn it is a solid rock, number 92 is a red hymn.
God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the goodness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. <laughs> what am I holding up here? What is that? Batteries. Yeah, that's right. It's a battery. Now, does it look doesn't look kind of healthy, does it? Looks kind of nasty, does it? Right. I pulled this out of a little radio I found when I was doing some painting at my house, and I recognized immediately this isn't going to work, is it? No. And the thing is, when something's like this, all we can really do is just throw it away, right? Because it's not any good anymore. Has no has no power, has no energy. Okay? Now, here's the cool thing about our relationship with Jesus. Okay. Jesus doesn't treat us like old batteries. There are times when we're tired, we're worn out, and all of this. But what Jesus does is he gives us energy. He gives us new life so that in all these ways we can rejoice in what it means to have him caring for us. And so he makes us like a new battery, not like an old one. And so we can really be happy that Jesus does that for us. Okay? Let's pray. Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, for all the ways in which you Give us new energy. We give thanks in your name. Amen. Come on. Thank you. Come on, Kim. silence. 
as we talk, come to our time of prayer, of course, I have the uh, prayer concerns listed here. I was asked to add one from Wilma for Stephanie, who is up at Hammett dealing with cancer. Okay. And um, I bring another one for somebody I don't know. Somebody I met yesterday. I was with friends, uh, with a friend down in Pittsburgh on North Side, uh, because docked there is an old uh, World War II ship. Um, and so it's, it's the LSC 330 Bible, and I went, we went for a tour. And while we were there, we met a homeless fellow and had an interesting conversation with him, and now he's worked it out through the Veterans Administration where he's actually going to have housing. And so it was a very interesting conversation with this guy. I won't go into details. He didn't even give us his name or anything, but we had a nice chat. And so I just want us to remember him, you know, and all the hum there are homeless veterans in this country. Keep them in mind as well. Okay. Any other additions, corrections? He would like prayer for our German family as they fly back this week. Okay. okay. What part of Germany? Yes, ma'am. And I like prayers for our only son today. He's only flying back to Arizona on Wednesday. Okay. His name again? Dave. Dave? Yes. Junior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's he flying to me last week. I didn't know he was coming. Oh, well, it was a little football. So, yeah, I was really surprised. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Then let's turn to the Lord in the time of prayer, and let's pray. O Lord, as we rest from our labors, please give us the refreshment and renewal only you can provide. This is yet another way we can know how much you care for us. There are many in this land who do not know the blessings of a relationship with you, the richness of your grace. We pray for the Spirit to embolden us as we go through our daily lives. We do not know who we will meet, but we do know it is your will that we show compassion for those we encounter. Dear Jesus, it is your grace which turns our hearts to you. Please forgive us, please give us your vision to see all the ways in which you're good to us so we may have a celebration of faith. There are many who have lives made heavy by their burdens. May we be part of lifting those burdens and we, we lift them up to you. In this time, O oh Lord, we lift up our Facebook friends in need, the Candace Hathis family, Carl Green, Norma, the Splitstone family, Pat, Helen and Jim, Emma, Faye, Betsy. Prayers for forgiveness for our members. Uh, unspoken prayer for a family member. Our, our recent graduates, uh, Reverend Walter Clark, Billy, Pastor Dave, Norm, uh, Dave, Lawrence, Danny and Judy, Jim, Pastor Bill, Rick. Gail, Nalana, Stephanie, of course, for our German friends who are and family who are flying home, for Dave as he's flying, for children and their return to school. Indeed, Lord, we do, do lift up all those who are in nations where there is so much turmoil. And we know that it is your will for there to be peace. And we remember all those who place themselves in peril so that we may enjoy the blessings of liberty. And now, Lord, bless us 
As we pray the prayer, you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us sing hymn number 35.
Oh Lord, for all the ways in which you're good to us, we give thanks. And in return, but a portion of all that goodness, the ability of your kingdom on earth. Pray all this, Lord, in your name. Amen. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Our Old Testament lesson this morning is from Exodus chapter 20, beginning at the 8th verse. Let us hear the word of God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Our New Testament lesson is from Matthew chapter 28, beginning at the 16th verse. Let us hear the word of God. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When he saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, be with us in this time, we do pray in your name. Amen. I've just, our New Testament passage that I've just read is, of course, called the Great Commission. But I would argue that's not the first commission you find in the Bible. I would argue that the first commission goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, we find verse 20, okay, there you are, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. There's the first commission. Because we are given dominion over the earth. But that's not to exploit it. That's to care for it. That's to cherish the earth that we've been given. All that we have been given, we are to care for it. So that's where the first commission starts. And the Lord did not put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden so they could just kick back and sit around. Quite the contrary. They were given ta the task of caring for that place. And in caring for the Garden of Eden, then eventually, it was supposed to happen that way, eventually go out and care for everything else. Go beyond the garden and see everything else that needed to be cared for. Somebody had to be put in charge. That was the job given to Adam and Eve. And his own effort, his own image, provides part of why they were to care. Because they were being made in his image, in a godly image. So the God who created everything that they had was the same God who put them in charge. Now, I try to have this conversation with adolescents. And there are times when I just don't get my point across because I tell them that in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had everything they needed. Does that mean they had cell phones? Why not? They did not need them. That's right. Try, try explaining that to a kid these days, right? <laughs> And yet, that was part of placing them, there was a part of how God was caring for them, was also a part of how um, they had this task set before them. So, there is to be rest, but we find this um, in uh, Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heavens, yeah, everything's done. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. Now, remember, that wasn't creating earth. That was creating everything. Okay? That took some effort, I, I would argue, on God's part. Then God sanctified the seventh day, blessed the, sanctify, the seventh day, and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. There was the, before there was the rest, there was the labor, there was the effort. So when we get to the seventh day, don't skip over the first six days. And what those six days mean, their significance, their importance. Because when we do that, 
then we have a grasp of the blessing that rest can be. Remember, for God, the starting point for all this is the creation of the universe. In a real sense, he did his part when he did that. And he did it for our sakes. Because all this was intended to be a great blessing. So where else do we find effort? Where else do we find um, people laboring? Well, you might remember the story of uh, Joseph. Now, Joseph has a learning experience because Joseph grew up as his father's favorite and his brothers knew it. He was raised in comfort. Raised, you know, given a coat of many colors and all of that. Um, and so his brothers, he's sent out to check on his brothers, and he goes back and gives dad a bad report that they're not doing their job right. And so eventually, his brothers decide, well, we're going to kill him. Then now we'll just throw him in an empty cistern. Then, you know, thanks to Reuben, then, okay, okay, we'll sell him to passing Ishmaelites. So he goes very quickly from a position of being in great honor to being a slave. Now he gets, he ends up in Egypt. And there's a man named Potiphar who buys him. Now, what Joseph does is significant here because this man who is raised so well is now having to serve not only somebody he doesn't know, he has to serve somebody who is not a family member, who's a foreigner. And at the time, it was considered um, just terrible for an Egyptian to eat with a Hebrew. So Potiphar wasn't even going to dine with him. But what he does is Joseph labors for Potiphar. And this takes a while, but in laboring for Potiphar, he is able to bring success to the man who bought him. So much so that his master ultimately recognizes his effort, recognizes his, the prosperity that this Hebrew is bringing to this Egyptian and puts him in charge of everything. A remarkable act for the day. And things work out so well that even though Potiphar's wife lies about him and he ends up in prison for a while, you know, he knows how to interpret dreams. And every time he gives a positive interpretation of a dream, he doesn't take credit for himself. He gives credit to the Lord. And this keeps working out. He keeps having the success. But he doesn't quit. He doesn't give up. He doesn't say, poor me. Why did this happen to me? The Lord uses this as an opportunity to raise him up and teach Joseph what it means to be, truly means to be a servant working for the Lord. Yes, he worked for Potiphar. Yes, eventually he worked for Pharaoh and all of this. But he knew that his ultimate master was the Lord. Now, we find in Exodus 20 this commandment about resting. But it's resting after working. This is God's choice. God is setting the date. And you see all these festivals in the Old Testament. God was setting the dates there as well. So as I was working on this, I took a look at our tradition here called Thanksgiving. And did you know that's not the original date? The original date moved around. And there were times when 
a president would declare a day of thanksgiving, but that was the president's choice. And so it bounced around. And there are times when there was no national holiday. And it wasn't until 1942 that the current date was made official. But the Lord's not doing that. He's not saying, go rest someday. He's telling them when to have that day of rest. He's giving them a very specific commandment. And that's what they were to do. Over and over again, that was their task. The, you know, uh, has been our task to then celebrate what it means to be able to give thanks. But giving thanks for all we have been provided for and all we have been able to accomplish ourselves. The, the thanksgiving comes second. Now we find in Isaiah chapter 6 the ways in which the Lord was getting Isaiah ready to be a prophet. Now this was not an easy task. You read through the Old Testament and you won't find anybody showing up at the temple or some such place saying, hey, hey, I want to fill out the application. I want to do indeed or, or whatever and I want to be a prophet. Give me the job. That doesn't happen. <laughs> it never happens. It's God's choice. Now, and so we find in Isaiah chapter 6, all the ways in which the Lord got Isaiah ready for his labors. And once he's gotten him ready, once those, those preparations have been made, you know, he becomes overwhelmed. He has this vision of God sitting on the throne. All this, all these fireworks are going off. And his response is, woe is me, I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I will dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For I have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Okay. He starts off this, his prophetic call, with a sense of his own inadequacy. I can't do this. What are you doing? Verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he taken the tongs from the altar. Verse 7. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, so your sin is purged. Okay. This is part of Isaiah's training, grasping what the Lord wanted him to do. Verse 8, Also I heard the voice of the Lord, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Now Isaiah understood. Now he grasped that he was ready, had been made ready by God to go forth and spread the news. A news of reconciliation, a news of repentance. And he was blessed to have that task. But the Lord made him worry, worthy for a purpose. Now we find in Mark, 6, Mark chapter 1, Verse 16, we find that Peter is already working. He had a job. What was he doing? He was a fisherman. And um, he was at his task in all of this. No, oh, where are you? I thought I marked you. Anyway, he had his task. He was providing for his family and simply going about his day. Once again, he did not say, hey, God, when the Messiah shows up, send him, send him to me. You know, I want to join up. No, instead, this is what happens. And this is speaking of Jesus. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon being another name for Peter, 
his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Okay, recognize their task. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, or more properly, fishers of people. Then immediately they left their nets and followed him. Once again, this was a call to work, a different kind of work, and it's an argument that I agree with that there may have been times when Peter went back to fishing, you know, to continue to support his family. But his ultimate task was to labor God's way. That's why Jesus called him. <laughs> That's why Jesus called him. Why Peter? Why not? But the goal was to have this man seek, find ways, seek ways to simply serve the Lord in a new fashion. So then we get to the Great Commission. Now, when you look at this, I don't blame the disciples for having struggles. Because they spent three years with Jesus and three years of times when just what was going on didn't make a heck of an awful lot of sense. I mean, they had this image of how a Messiah was supposed to function. And yet there are times when Jesus just didn't do that. Their reality had really changed, really shifted. And every time somebody had been crucified, that person had stayed dead. Now Jesus was showing up again. He was alive. He could eat with them. And so he talked to them after the resurrection. And he gives them this message. He reminds them of his power. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Okay. They get that by this point. Then he says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, okay? They're not called to just stay in their nice, comfortable little area. They're to go to places they never even imagined they would go to. And when they get there, they're to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And so it's a message to include everyone, they're supposed to get people wet, supposed to baptize them, and because that's a sign of joining the family of God. And they're supposed to do all this. And it's not a burden he was placing on them. It was a happy obligation, a task they could fulfill with joy. And then we have this promise. Now, they're supposed to teach them teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you, then we get this promise. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And that's how the Lord Jesus wanted them to function. To go forth, and he's trained them up, they're ready for this task. And yet, they're called upon to continue to work. To not kick back, to not say, okay, this is great. Now I, you know, I'm assured I'm going to go to heaven. Now they're to show it. But that's not beating on them. That's not weighing them down. That's blessing them with the opportunity to go forth and share the message of grace that they have received first. And that's what we are called to do. Now, this is Labor Day weekend. Now, I have spent the summer in various ways, spent the summer working, doing all sorts of stuff, um, working at my job, going around and preaching and all of this. And I had an opportunity to get together with a friend of mine and do a few things in Pittsburgh. And that was fun. That was refreshing. And it was nice to have that opportunity to relax but that was after working. And even though we had, I 
longtime friend, and even though we had arguments about how to get through Pittsburgh, we still had that opportunity. And so, if you have the opportunity this weekend to truly kick back and relax, that's good news. Remember all the ways in which we can still do work for the sake of the gospel, because that's a blessing we have been given. And so even if it's just a nice little chat, as I mentioned, with a homeless guy who was looking forward, now finally they were going to give him a house, but he was okay. He just wanted someone to talk to, so he talked to us for a while. And even if it's just little ways like that, it can still be a blessing that we are given that we can go forth and do that. And in all these ways, for all the celebrations we can do, for all the labor we've done, in all these ways, we can give thanks that God has cared for us in all these ways. And for that, we can say, Amen. And now let us sing, sing hymn number 656. And now go in peace. May God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us. In your name, amen. Yeah.